So now, little man. <laughs> You've grown tired of grass, LSD, acid, cocaine, and hash, and someone pretending to be a true friend said, I'll introduce you to Miss Heroin. Well, honey, before you start fooling with me, just let me inform you of how it will be. For I will seduce you and make you my slave. I've sent men much stronger than you to their graves. You think you could never become a disgrace and end up addicted to poppy seed waste? So you'll start inhaling me one afternoon. You'll take me into your arms very soon. And once I have entered deep down in your veins, the craving will nearly drive you insane. You'll need lots of money, as you have been told, for darling. I'm much more expensive than gold. You'll swindle your mother, and just for a buck, you'll turn into something vile and corrupt. You'll mug and you'll steal for my narcotic charm and feel contentment when I'm in your arms. The day when you realize the monster you've grown, you'll solemnly promise to leave me alone. If you think that you've got the mystical knack, then, sweetie, just try getting me off your back. The vomit, the cramps, your gut tatted or not, the jangling nerves screaming for just one more shot, the hot chills, the cold sweat, the withdrawal pains can only be saved by my little white grains. There's no other way. And there's no need to look, for deep down inside, you will know you are hooked. You'll desperately run to the pusher, and then you'll welcome me back to your arms once again. And when you return, just as I foretold, I know that you'll give me your body and soul. You'll give up your morals, your conscience, your heart, and you will be mine until death do us part. <laughs> <laughs> So now, little man. I am Jack B. Renoise, Captain, Narcotics Division, Houston Police Department. As a law enforcement officer over the past 25 years, I've seen and worked with thousands of underworld characters, a great percentage of which are junkies. Jolie Kirkpatrick was one of them. Through the years, I've watched helplessly as Joe's life went down the drain. He refused to heed the voice of experience. I was his friend, but he didn't accept it. In 1964, we had the goods on Joe, about to send him up for his second prison term. But something happened, as you will hear. A change took place in Joe's life. This change has proven true over the past nine years. My letter of recommendation to the governor of the state of Texas in behalf of Joe Lee Kirkpatrick, ex-junkie, is a first. I hold this man in the highest regard and admiration and pray there will be many more to follow his example. Joe Lee can and does tell it like it is. I too wrote a letter to the governor on behalf of Joe Lee Kirkpatrick. I am Ralph Neighbor, pastor of the West Memorial Baptist Church in Houston where Joe Lee and his family hold membership. If you visited in our area, we might drive together through a sea of apartment houses and better-than-average homes. 
And I'd just like to bear witness that the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ transforms middle class and well-to-do people just as readily as it can transform a dope addict. And so the message that Joe Lee speaks next is for all. Would you let me be more specific? The message he speaks is for you. The question people most frequently ask me, Joe, did it all start with marijuana? And frankly, I have to tell them, no, I didn't become a heroin addict because it all started with marijuana. It really started when I was just a boy, when I was started sneaking around, conniving, lying and cheating, deceiving my parents and friends. I can remember my mother used to take us to Sunday school and church. We used to go every Sunday. The big yellow bus would come by and pick us up. We'd go to the First Baptist Church in downtown Houston. I can remember when I was in Sunday school, I was, I was one of these smart aleck punks that always sat on the back row and I'd shuffle my feet around and I'd chew up the spitballs and flip them around the room. I never paid any attention to what the teacher was saying. At first, in the early years, I kind of liked to go to Sunday school because it was something to do. But then when the older kids started making fun of the people who went to Sunday school and church and called them squares and sissies, well, I didn't want anyone calling me a square or sissy, so I started making excuses to drop out of Sunday school, and most of the time my mother would make me go anyway. Well, then I started resenting the fact that I was in Sunday school and church, and I would just dream about how my friends were out on the ball field playing and having fun and a good time, and... I can remember sitting on the back row in church. I could just be looking right in the preacher's face and just be listening to everything he said, but really it was going in one ear and out the other. I just couldn't wait to get home and have that good hot dinner. My mother always cooked a hot Sunday dinner, and then I'd go out and play with my friends. And It seems as though my whole desire was for them to hear the last prayer so I could hightail it out that back door. But one day when I was 13 years old, I don't know, I guess my heart was just touched and I, I, I knew I was a sinner when I was 13. I'd already been a thief and lying and conniving and, and stealing. And as I sat in the church service and I, I heard the preacher preach, I saw others going down and shaking the preacher's hand. I wanted to go to heaven as a boy. I wanted to get my life straightened out. I knew I was headed down the wrong road. So I went forward too and got in line and I shook the preacher's hand. A tragedy took place that day as I shook the preacher's hand. He gave me a card to fill out and told me to come back the following week and be baptized. I never took Jesus Christ into my heart. I never turned from my sins. My life was never changed. I just went right on being the same old person. Well, finally I decided, because I sat in the back row and I picked out the hypocrites all the time, I decided that me doing the things I was doing and going to church, well, I was just being like the rest of the hypocrites. I dropped out of Sunday school and church, and I started just looking for thrills and pleasures and excitement, adventure. The other kids that I was running around with, they started on cigarettes, and I felt I had to follow in their footsteps and be one of the fellas, so I started smoking when I was 11 years old. Little did I know that two years later I'd be taking my first puff of marijuana. Little did I know that 17 years later I'd be, it'd be harder for me to kick the nicotine habit than a dope habit that had cost me $150 per day. But like so many kids, they only think of the thrill they're going to get right now. Well, the Bible says there's pleasure in sin, but it only lasts for a season. I had the pleasures and I had the excitement and the thrill, but it left me empty, lonely, full of despair and shame and guilt. And the more sins I committed, the more I needed to cover it up to, to try to get away from the guilt of it. Well, I was pushing marijuana to some high school kids at a high school across town from where I went. And these kids started uh, shooting heroin on Saturday night. Well, I was running around with them and I was supplying them with marijuana. Here I'd like to say that 
Most adults, they think it's some lurking characters going around our high schools, slipping off uh, marijuana and heroin on the, our junior and senior high school kids. But I try to tell people wherever I go, if your kids or grandkids get on dope, it'll be their best friend that gets them started. I didn't try to get these kids on dope. They were all willing. They wanted it. And I just uh, found I could make a quick buck by supplying it. So these kids started taking heroin and at first I didn't care about taking any needles in my arm or anything but just by being around them one day they came up a couple of dollars short before they could go buy any stuff so I said well I'll pitch in the two dollars well when the dope fiend came back with the dope well I just said well I'm gonna get my two dollars worth so I took my first fix like that then I found myself just every Saturday night I looked forward to to going and scoring for some dope and then it became Friday and Saturday nights Thursday Friday and Saturday before I knew it I was uh, just taking dope every day I just loved so much what it did for me because it seemed to make me forget my emptiness and my loneliness I was filled with desire uh, anxieties and fear well before I knew it about six months had gone by and I was shooting dope every day just because I wanted it well I went over to my pusher's house one day and I knocked on the door and nobody came to the door I found out later in the day that he had gotten busted in a police narcotics dragnet the night before I thought well that's too bad he got busted I went on about my business and I noticed that I started feeling kinda aches and pains and my body was hurting and my eyes were watering my nose was running and at first I felt like I was coming down with the flu I thought nothing about it but as hours rolled on the pains became more intense and I thought and I don't know what's happening I, it really is hurting it dawned on me Joe you're hooked I had the monkey on my back and I knew from that moment on that the only thing that would satisfy and alleviate that hurting and pain was just another shot of dope. Up until that point it was all for fun and glamour and thrills and kicks. But once I knew I was hooked and once I had to get the dope or be sick, I started a living hell. And at first, see, the dope started you know it made you feel good for a little while and give you kind of a boost or pleasures but after I became hooked I had to take dope just to feel normal just to be uh, to keep the sick off and then when I would take dope and and I'd get the sick off and it wouldn't really give me a good high well then I'd take more dope just to get that high and then when my resistance would build up I would need more dope and more dope and more dope I wound up in the state penitentiary when I was 19 years old for possession of marijuana. When I was released from prison, I went right back to the same old things, the same old crowd, the same old activity. All I thought about was making up for lost time. My brother had some marijuana and some dope the day I was released from prison. I could just hardly wait till we got rid of my daddy so we could sneak off and take it. I started right back to the same old things again. Well, my life was in and out of jails. I'd be up one day and down the next. Before I knew it, I began to think, Joe, you'd be better off dead than like you are. I'd tried everything I knew to get off a of dope. I'd tried what the psychologists say. They don't have the answer. The sociologists don't have the answer. Law enforcement don't have the answer. Being locked up in the penitentiary didn't help me. Science doesn't have the answer. Education doesn't have the answer. I didn't know which way to turn. I tried everything. Man doesn't have the answer for the cure for dope addicts. So I just tried to do the best I could. It was up one day and down the next. Bobby Mankin was a friend of mine and he and I grew up together and we were going back and forth to the Mexican border we were smuggling in shipments of heroin well the dope didn't last long because we sold it and shot it up and they would make make another trip when we run out every time we'd cross that border and we'd be on our way back we'd both start whining on each other's shoulder man it's not worth it we kept saying we'd be sticking the needle in our arm 
next hour or two would do it again. Man, it's not worth it. We'd be sticking the needle in our arm again. During the course of trying to figure out how we were going to get out of the trap we were in, Bobby started telling me about a newspaper article which his mother had called to his attention a couple of weeks earlier. It seems as though Freddie Gage, some ex-hood or punk or something, had turned preacher and he had opened up a rehabilitation center for drug addicts. Well, Bobby knew Freddie and I said, man, why don't you call over there and see if the dude will help us. Bobby called and we sure felt good because Freddie said, yeah, come on over. If you really want help, we've got the sure cure and we'd be glad to help you. Well, Bobby and I went over there. I don't know how we got there. We were so full of dope. And when we walked up the sidewalk to the rickety old mansion where they had opened up a place to help addicts, we went in there and they invited us in. And they were having some kind of a meeting. And so we just sat out on the back row. It wasn't long before Bobby turned to me and I turned to him and I said, Man, what we done got ourselves into? They're having a church service. This is some kind of religious deal or something? Well, we had mixed emotions about staying at Freddy's place. But one thing we could see that these people really cared about us. They cared about dope addicts. So we just decided we'd go ahead and stay a while. We didn't know what was going to happen, but... We really did want to kick the habit, so we stayed. Well, old Freddie told us right, right first crack out of the box. He said, Joe, Jesus Christ can give you a brand new life. I thought, oh, no, here we go with this religion bit. And I'd had enough of that phony baloney religion, bunch of hypocrites and all. But, you know, it dawned on me in a minute. Freddie wasn't telling me about religion or church or getting baptized or turning over a new leaf or nothing like that. He was telling me about a person, about Jesus Christ. Well, my only concept about Jesus was, you know, just I'd heard about Jesus in church and Sunday school, but I never had really any idea that he was alive or real or that there was anything to it. In fact, when I dropped out of church in Sunday school, I gave up on God. I didn't even believe in God. Oh, sometimes I'd think, I'd look at the animals and I'd look at the people and I'd... I'd look at creation and the thought would be in my mind, surely there must be a God or a creator or something. And when I couldn't figure it all out, I'd think, nah, nothing to it. And I'd go right back to my pleasures. My life was just geared for pleasures and selfish gain. I can remember I'd sit at home all day and I'd sell dope out of my house and I'd just wait for the phone to ring. I'd watch TV all day long. I knew every program that came on TV. I knew every commercial by heart. My life was filled with sports and athletics. I kept up with baseball, basketball, football. I was just a sports fiend. I went to all the dances and musical concerts, and I kept up with any kind of activity, you know, that a person could get involved with. But really, I was empty on the inside. I was so lonely and and I was becoming bitter in life. I couldn't find success. I couldn't find happiness. And the more I tried, the harder it seemed to... It seemed like life was escaping me. Well, when I was 28 years old, my life was already washed out. And as I said, I'd tried everything the world had to offer for the cure of dope addiction. Nobody has the answer. And here they were telling me that Jesus Christ could change my life, that he could give me a brand new heart. Well, I didn't know what they were talking about, but it sure sounded good to an old washed out dope fiend. I looked at what I had on one hand. Well, the cigarettes didn't satisfy, the booze didn't satisfy, the sex thrills didn't satisfy, the Cadillac cars that I drove didn't satisfy, and on and on and on. Oh, I had plenty of money. I wasn't a washed out gutter bum, I was just washed out on the inside. I could still function in society. I still made my way. But there was such an emptiness in my heart. And really, I'd rather been dead than continue like I was. I just couldn't find the answer. And here they were telling me that the answer was in in God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Not only were they showing me this from the Bible and telling me all about it, 
But I began to notice that these Christians really had something in their lives. They had something real. I knew one thing, they had something I didn't have. Well, I got to watching Jerry Wayne Bernard. He was one of the co-directors with Freddie. Oh, Jerry would sing, and he would preach, and he would teach, and, and I, just, I just kept watching him, and I thought, man, if I could only have what Jerry's got, I'd give anything. Well, three days later, I found out I could have exactly what Jerry Bernard had, but I had to be willing to give everything. Well, at this rehabilitation center, they had a guest speakers come every day. Usually it was a different preacher. Sometimes they'd come at 11 o'clock, 2 o'clock and 7.30 at night, and then they'd go out on the streets and pass out gospel literature. Well, this particular morning, a young evangelist, James Robinson, came, and as he stood before us, boy, I'll never forget the authority by which he spoke. He just simply got up there and told what the other Christians had been saying, that Christ died for sinners. Jesus came to set the captives free. I thought, man... You see, I used to be proud of my sin. I thought I was a smart aleck, uh, just, you know, big, tough guy. But now I wasn't proud of my sin anymore. It made me sick what I'd become. And really, it all started so innocently just as a boy. I just wanted to go along and have a few kicks. I wasn't going to get hooked. I didn't intend to become a, a dope fiend. I didn't intend for my life to be in prison and washed out and wanting to commit suicide when I was 28 years old. Well, I'd already died twice from overdoses and the people had breathed life back into me. I was already purple. I'd been out for three hours. Uh, my body was just, was just dead and they breathed into my mouth and I came back too. And they always told me that I was out for three hours and that I was dead and I'd say, oh, you just a bunch of liars. I just dozed off for a minute. But finally they would convince me and I'd say, within myself, man, why didn't I just go on die? I was sick of living that kind of life. And yet when I was a kid, it was glamorous. I wanted that kind of thing, but it didn't satisfy. And when I found out that it didn't satisfy, I was already hooked and couldn't do anything about it. And here James was standing up there. You see, I knew one scripture in the Bible, John 3:16. For God so loved the world. But I always thought, yeah, for God so loved the world, but who am I in this big old world? No one really cares anything about me. It's just dog eat dog. And you know as well as I do, the American philosophy is becoming, if it's not already, anything goes as long as you don't get caught. Well, this is the way I geared my life. And it brought me nothing but emptiness, loneliness, and shame. That morning, as James Robinson stood and preached the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ and that he died for sinners, I thought, well, if I'm a sinner, does that mean that Christ died for me? Well, if I'm a captive, if Jesus came to set the captives free, does that mean he came to set me free? All my life I had heard Baptist people say, do you know Jesus Christ as your very own personal Savior? I didn't know what they was talking about, but that morning when James preached, my heart was touched, and I went forward at the invitation or altar call or whatever it was, and I just thank God that James Robinson didn't give me a card to fill out and tell me to come back next week and get baptized, but old James got down on his knees with me and he opened up God's holy Bible. And he began to show me how I could have forgiveness of sin, how I, my sins and guilt of it could be taken away. And right there on my knees, it seems as though it wasn't for God so loved the world, but the scripture read something like this, For God so loved Jolie Kirkpatrick that he gave his only begotten son, that if Jolie Kirkpatrick would believe on him, he had not perished but have everlasting life. And James showed me, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And then another scripture said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And I thought, and I looked at what I had on one hand, and I looked at what God had offered me on the other hand. 
through Jesus Christ, peace that passes all understanding, through Jesus Christ, joy unspeakable and full of glory, a friend that sticks closer than a brother, power, victory, peace. Man, I looked at what I had and I looked at what God offered. You know, even a fool can see what he ought to do. Well, as I was on my knees, all I, I didn't know any prayers. I used to pray when I was a kid. I'd say, oh, God, way up there in heaven somewhere, if you're there, I hope you get me out of jail. I'll never do it again. But here I was praying to a personal Christ who was a present help in time of need, and I just simply said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Come into my heart and change my life, for I give my life to you. And after I prayed my prayer, I looked over into James's face, and he looked into mine, and knowing what I was, he wanted to be sure. He said, Joe, did Jesus come into your heart? And just for a moment, it flashed back in my mind what the Bible had said. And you're either going to believe the Bible or you're not. And I'd made it in my heart. I said, I'm going to believe God. And if that don't work, then there's no hope for me. And actually, I'm sorry to say that I was turning to God as a last resort. I'd searched everywhere for the answers of life and the answers to my problems. And I looked into James's face. And I said, yes, James. Jesus kept his word. You see, God wouldn't be much of a God if he could lie, if he didn't keep his word. And he said plainly that he had come into my heart, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I had called upon him, and I meant it in my heart, and I knew that it was now or never. I was going to believe the word of God, or I was going to be lost forever. James looked into my face, and I looked into his and I picked up his Bible and I said, James, as we looked at it, I said, how much more sure can a person be? I said, yes, thank God Jesus came into my heart and he saved me. James said, a smile came on his face and a smile came on my face and he said, well, praise God, let's just bow our heads and thank him. And we did. James prayed and thanked the Lord and I prayed and thanked the Lord and you know I've been thanking him ever since. That's been nine years ago. Right off of the bat, there were skeptics around. Some said, oh, Joe, you won't last a week. You're on some religious kick. You won't last six weeks. Some said, oh, if you last a year, you'll make a believer out of me. Well, it's been nine years, and I guess the skeptics are still saying, well, he won't last ten. But I'm just going on with God. I've just found that every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And I'm so proud that I can recommend my Lord to anyone.
recommend my Lord to you. I recommend my Lord to you. I shall never forget his mercy. I recommend my Immediately after I made my faith commitment to Jesus Christ, Satan began to torment me. He began to bring doubts into my mind, and I knew I had to either stand on what God said or I'd be right back down the drain like I was. And I was so sick, as I mentioned, I was going through cold turkey withdrawal. I couldn't even sit still and read the Bible, but I could listen to the preaching and I could listen to the Christians pray and I could listen to them as they fellowshiped and magnified Jesus among themselves. And then I'd go out to churches and I'd give my testimony and I'd tell how Jesus came into my heart and how he had delivered me from the bondage of sin. I was bound in the slave market of sin and it started so innocently as a boy. And I'd see the faces of the people in the church and you'd walk down the aisle and you'd sit up there on the platform and look out at the people and it looked like the people had just enough religion to make them miserable. And I used to tell this, I'd say, it looked like half the people been vaccinated with pickle juice. And people always laugh and they think that's funny. But it's so sad to me when I go into churches everywhere and I see the faces on the people. Oh yeah, you can see those with joy and peace and gladness that know Christ and know what you're talking about. But so many, you see that empty, lonely, bewildered look, and it, you just think they're right on the verge of really going for Christ all the way, and yet they've been church members all their lives, they've grown up in the church, many of them. They don't, don't have any life. And this is what I try to train my converts. The new, new Christians, I tell them, you ought to be able to go in the coldest, deadest church and be alive for God. You know, many times people go into a warm, friendly church and they feel warmed and they feel friendly, but if they go into a cold, dead church, they feel cold and dead. These people have nothing of their own in their own heart. And this is what I want to encourage Christians, to let go and let God have his way in your life and, and be alive in God. Don't worry about uh, the preacher, if he's going to like it, if you say amen or praise the Lord or what do any of the deacons think or the church members. This is what we are, alive in Christ. And I found through Bible study and sticking with God's children, if it wasn't for Jesus in my heart, I probably would have dropped out of church again, even, even now, knowing the Lord. But I found that hypocrites need the love of God, just like the dope addicts and the drunkards. So I try to encourage the hypocrites to turn to Jesus as well as the down and outers and the dope addicts and the run-of-the-mill people that we would really label sinners. I was in one night in a Christian coffee house and I looked out the window and I saw a police officer that once had arrested me and I went over to him and I wanted to tell him how Jesus had changed my life. I went up and introduced myself to him and I said, you, you don't remember me, do you? He said, no, I, I don't guess I do. And he looked me over. Well, when he knew me, I weighed 128 pounds, and at, at that time, I weighed 210. And he said, no, I don't guess I know you. And I said, well, I'm Jolie Kirkpatrick. And he backed off a minute, and he said, yeah, I remember you, yeah, and some of your cousins and brothers. I shared with him what Christ had done for me, and I talked to him about his soul. I was interested in that police officer's soul, and... And so I checked him out if he knew Christ and, and if God was real in his life. And he bowed his head and he said, No, Joe, he said, To tell you the truth, I'm just a backslidden Baptist. So I encouraged him and, and tried to lift him up and, and, and told him how to get right with God and go on and don't worry about it. He didn't seem like he was interested in getting right with God. I turned to walk away. I told him I had to go back to the uh coffee house to help help them in there I was working there and I just had to turn and and I wheeled back around I said you know what 
I said, there's two good reasons why I know I'm a Christian today. And he said, well, Joe, what's that? And I said, well, reason number one, I love hypocrites. And reason number two, I love cops. He said, man, you have come a long way. And it's true. When Jesus comes into your heart, you'll love the things you once hated and you'll hate the things you once loved. And I find that regardless to what the condition of others in the church are, it's our responsibility as children of God to magnify Jesus in the church with the cold and dead or if they're alive and, and just hot wires for Jesus. We need to magnify Jesus one to another. Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself.